Deuteronomy 30 and 11. The Lord says here, the command that I'm giving to you today is not difficult or beyond your reach. It's not up in the sky. You don't have to ask who will go up and bring, bring it down for us that we may hear it and, and obey it. It's not on the other side of the ocean. You don't have to ask who will cross the ocean and bring it to us that we may hear it and obey it. No, it's here with you. You know it and can quote it. So now obey it. <laughs> it's here. You know it. You can quote it. So what? Obey. Do it. Obey. It's not just knowing something that, that makes a difference in your life. It's only what you do. And uh, keep going. Verse 15. He said, today I am giving you a choice between good and evil, between life and death. Keep reading for a few, a few verses here. If, everybody say if. Yeah. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I give you today, if you love him and obey him and keep all his laws, then you will prosper and become a nation of many people. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're about to occupy. Keep going. But if you disobey. Now this language you will see over and over again. Old Testament, law, prophets, New Testament, epistles. You'll see this idea over and over again. If you do this, this is going to happen. If you don't, you do something else, then something else is going to happen. Everybody say if. if. But if you disobey and refuse to listen and are led away to worship other gods, what's going to happen? You'll be destroyed. I warn you here and now, you will not live long in that land across the Jordan that you're about to occupy. Keep reading. I'm now giving you the choice. Who has the choice? Is it God's choice? No. It's man's choice. I'm now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse. And I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. He said, I'm saying this and I'm calling he heaven and earth to, to recognize and know that the choice is yours. I gave you the choice. And if in time to come you don't like what you got, you can't blame me. I gave you the choice. Everybody in heaven heard it. Everybody on the earth heard it. Hmm? In time to come, if somebody's complaining, why, why did this happen to me? Why didn't that happen to me? And you can fuss all you want. But at the end of life, he'll look around and everybody will say, he gave you the choice. <laughs> and in light of that, why are so many millions of Christians trying to say it's God's choice? It's up to God. All up to him. I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. And then he even tells you which one to pick. Right? <laughs> Choose life. Not, not death. Now, now sometimes people say, well, I didn't choose this. Yeah, mo more than you know. Because if they say, well, I didn't choose this life being cut short and, and this curse and all this stuff. Did you choose not to obey him? Because if you did, you chose death. If you want life, you have to choose to obey. You have to choose to do it his way. He said, the choice is yours. Now we got into this a few weeks ago and I want to go further into it. There are beliefs that are held as sacred among millions in the church world. And there are preachers and, and church goers that are very adamant about things like God is sovereign. <laughs> and most folks don't even know what they mean when they, when they say that. What does that mean? God is in control. Really? Of what? Everything. Really? You? God is in complete 
control of you? <laughs> Let's just start with yesterday. <laughs> Are we going to say that everywhere you went, everything you did, everything you said, everything you ate, everything you bought was the predetermined perfect will of God all day and all night because God's in control. <laughs> hmm? I've had people get, get upset with me about talking about some of these things. I had a guy come down after a, a service one time and he, I mean, he had fire in his eyes. He said, I want you to know God is sovereign. <laughs> And, and, and if he wants you to do something, then by God, you're going to do it. He's almost cussing. <laughs> that can tell you somewhere, you know, that can tell you something about where this is coming from. Yeah? So, you, you're going to do it. God wants you to do it. You're going to do it, little man. <laughs> Brother Hagin said, uh, my, Kenneth Hagin, my father in the faith, said years ago, he was preaching along some of these lines, and and, uh, and a guy just jumped up in the crowd, and and, and he said, uh, he said, I don't believe it. God is Almighty. God is sovereign, and if He wants you to do something, then you're going to do it. And he said, without even thinking, it just came, he didn't know the man. It just came right out of his mouth. He said, well, Why don't He make you pay your tithes then? <laughs> He said, the guy, the guy was standing up. He said, Israel, he just dunked down behind, behind the seat like that. <laughs> See, he wanted to get mouthy, and God just told off on him <laughs> in front of people. <laughs> Brother Hagin said, he often put his hand on his mouth. I thought, where'd that come from? <laughs> no, God's not making you do what he wants you to do. If he was going to make anybody do anything, he would make people get saved. Wouldn't he? He would make them get born again because that's eternity. Right? And if he's not going to make a person get saved, certainly he's not going to make people do this lesser stuff. The truth is, he gave us a choice. Did he or not? You can believe him or not. You can obey him or not. And so what we have in our life is this way or this way depending on the choice we made. The truth is there are all kind of things happening in this world that don't please God, that are not his will, that are not his plan. And people are going through all kind of terrible stuff because of their and their parents and their parents before them choices. Oh, but friend, there are some people that have come out, come out of some terrible stuff whose life is totally better than the people that they've known or been around and getting better all the time because they have chosen to believe him and chosen to go his way and obey him. Can you say amen? amen. Look with me at uh, two openings. Uh, Revelation, they'll put it up on the screen. Why don't you go to Ephesians 2? And we'll just put Revelation on the screen. Put Revelation 3.20 on the screen. And you'd, you'd be turning to Ephesians 2, please. The Master said this in Revelation 3.20. Behold. Hmm? I'm sovereign. <laughs> and I go where I want. When I want. No matter what you say. Huh? No. Behold what? I stand at the door and do what? Knock. Knock. If, this is big, 
People say, well, God, God is in control. If God is completely in control of everybody and everything, there can be no if. Come on, meditate on it. Think about it. If God's really controlling everybody and everything, there is no if. There can be no if. But he says, if any man will hear my voice, that's not just notice it, but acknowledge it, and do what? And do what? Open the door. What's going to happen? I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. You got to go back to if. What if you won't open the door? Hmm? If he doesn't come in, then he's not in the room with you. Your room is without him. Because he is without. What you're doing and where you are. In order for him to be within, you have to ask him in. You have to open the door. And he said, if you'll do that, I'll be in. I'll be involved. I'll be with you in it. What if you don't? In Ephesians 2, notice this. Ephesians 2 and 12. Ephesians 2, 12, we'll back up to verse 11. He said, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, verse 12, that at that time you were what? You were without Christ. Now you'll notice the New Testament, I can think of four instances in the New Testament where this uh, the people that are without is mentioned. You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and what? Amen. Without God in the world. Everybody say, without God. Without God. In, the world. in the world. And also what? Hopeless. Without hope. Everybody say, without God, without God is without hope. This word, without God, the two words, without God, represent one word in the Greek. The word atheos, which is where we get our word atheist from. <laughs> is there such a thing as an atheist? Yeah. But it's not how some think. What is an atheist? Well, some atheists, self-prescribed, would, would tell you, would assume that they are superior intelligence to folks like you and me. Simpletons like us who need the crutch of religion. That we're not, we're just somewhere or another not, not bright enough to see all the inconsistencies in this old patched together literary work. <laughs> and, you know, why pick this religion instead of the other plethora of religions available to believe? And so they're, they're above it and they have pull themselves away from our company and they're out of the muck of this thing called religion. But it's not true. The truth is all they've done is make themselves without God. That's what the word means. Without God. Now what if you are without God and without hope? Then is everything that's happening in your life the plan of God? The will of God? No, actually God is not in your life. You are without 
God. Are y'all with me, friends? This is a, a different mentality than many have. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew. There's some things here that can answer a lot of questions for us. Some of this you may have to chew on a bit. Hmm? How many understand if it's meat in the Word, uh, you couldn't just swallow it. You'd choke. You have to chew on it. Right? So some of these things you need to chew on. Don't just take my word for it now. Search this book. And if you think you believe something different, don't just say, well, I believe different. Where is it in the book? Discipline yourself. Make yourself find the verses. And if, if you can't find them, that should tell you something. Yes. Right? <laughs> that should be a wake-up call for you. <laughs> uh, you're going to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. And let me remind you of what we studied last time along this line. Well, we'll read this first, then, I'll, then we'll say it like that. Matthew 22, and I believe it's 14. 22, 14 says what? Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. You see this more than one time in the New Testament. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, some folks would read that or hear that and they think, well, you know, it's still up to God, whoever He chooses or not. It's His choice. But back up and read the previous verses and see how Jesus got to the statement. Verse 1, Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, and He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Keep going. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they what? They what? They would not come. You think about the king of kings. Ask you to come to something he's doing. And you say, no. <laughs> the head of the church <laughs> calls your name invites you and you say mm, no I'm not coming verse 4 he sent forth other servants and said tell them that are bidden he gives them another opportunity they ignored and blew off the first invitation he says tell them look behold means look I've prepared my dinner my oxen my fatlings everything's ready come on Come on. Verse 5. And they what? Oh, friend, this is serious. The Lord said, those that honor me, I will honor. Those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. In the Word of God, to despise something could be as simple as ignoring it. If the Lord says something, it's not to be ignored, right? Right? If He calls you to do something, it's not something to see if you can squeeze in to your schedule. It's time to push the schedule off the desk. Right? Why? Because He called. You drop everything. You change your plans. If Jesus is your Lord, that's how you operate. There's a lot of folks, Jesus is their Savior, but He's not their Lord. They won't be inconvenienced to serve Him. They made light of it. They went their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. Keep going. The remnant of his servants, uh, they were entreated spitefully and they killed him. Now see, the Lord is telling something that portrays what has happened from the beginning up until now. The king was wroth. Let's just stop right here. Have we seen other places where the Lord was wroth, angry with His people? Yes. If, if they're doing what it was predetermined for them to do, how can He be justified in being angry with them? When they couldn't do anything else because it was God's plan for them to do it. That's right. 
He was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Keep going. Then he said to the servants, The wedding is ready, and they which were bidden were not worthy. I invited them, but they weren't worthy. Keep going. So go to the highways, and as many as you can find, bid to the marriage. I want you to get the picture here now. Who's getting invited now? Somebody else. We're going to have a wedding. We're going to have a feast. The Lord's going to have his party. (laughs) And it's going to be good. And it's going to be full of guests. And it's going to be awesome. The question is, are you going to be there? (laughs) Am I going to be there? (laughs) Bid them. Come in. Verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found. These were people who had not been previously invited. (laughs) But some new new openings had just occurred. (laughs) There was some free places at the table. Why? Because people were too busy. They were called. But because they wouldn't respond, they weren't the chosen. Mm -hmm. So all this builds up to that phrase, many are called, Mm -hmm. but few are chosen. That's what he said at the end of this whole story. Mm -hmm. So they found them good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with gifts. Everybody say, the wedding was furnished. It was furnished. When people say, God is sovereign. His will is going to be done. His plan is going to be completed. And I say, amen. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But he can do things more than one way. And it does not have to be with the ones he first called and asked. And though he needs us, me or you as an individual are not irreplaceable if we decide to ignore him and rebel against him long enough. This is something I'm just recently understanding better. There's been more than one instance in the last 30 some years of, of ministry where the Lord would send me, send Phyllis and myself, the ministry, to do certain things, certain parts of the country, certain uh, parts of the body. And man, you could tell it was supernatural. It was God. And you thought, well, man, this, this is going to go like this. And it didn't. And people that said they wanted it decided they didn't want it. And things just didn't go that way and and weeks turned into months and months turned into years and then the Lord would deal with you, do this over here in a completely different place. And you think, well now, it bothered me at first because I said, well Lord, I I thought you dealt with me to do this. He did. But they didn't want it. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't receive it. And it made me scratch my head for a while. And one day while I was praying about this, I said, Lord, now you don't change your mind. You know the end from the beginning. You're not going to tell me this way and then later on, well, no, do it this way. But he does. I said he does. There are instances of it in the scripture. Why? Because he's not going to make people Receive him and do his will and plan, and many are called, but not not everybody responds. And he brought me to this passage in Exodus. We talked about it earlier. That when the the Lord was angry with with his people because they had forsaken him and made these golden calves, and and, and, uh, the man of God came down off the mountain. And and he told him, he said, uh, leave me alone. Let me just read it to you. It's Exodus 32, uh, 9 or so. 
Exodus 32, 9. He said, I've seen this people. It's a stiff-necked people. How many know stiff-necked is bad, bad? Don't be stiff-necked. Why don't you tell your neighbor, tell them right now. I said, don't be stiff-necked. <laughs> don't, don't be. <laughs> you might know what stiff-necked is. You're getting instruction. You're getting correction. And what do you do? Hmm? <laughs> you ain't going to do it, and nobody can make you do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Friend, that can mess you up so bad, the Lord himself can't help you. I know that's a giant thing to say, but I said it in a minute. Search the scriptures. Why? Because he has chosen not to force you to do something, and he said, it's your choice. Keith and Phyllis Moore and Faith Life Church of Sarasota invite you to join us for the 2013 Marriage Enrichment Meeting, June 3rd through the 7th. Come and receive answers, help, and strength from the Word of God on marriage, and learn how a man and woman can truly experience a flourishing and enjoyable life together based on biblical truths. Whether you are married or desire to be, everyone is welcome. Services begin at 7.30 each evening, and children's ministry will be provided. Faith Life Church of Sarasota is located at 6980 Professional Parkway East in Sarasota, Florida. For more information, visit our website, flcsarasota.org, or call us at 941-388-6961.